For Women's History Month, this is a woman composer portrait with Catherine Michel. Jennifer Higdon is a major figure in contemporary classical music. She received the 2010 Pulitzer Prize in Music for her violin concerto and has won three Grammy Awards for Best Contemporary Classical Composition, first for her percussion concerto in 2010, in 2018 for her viola concerto, and in 2020 for her harp concerto. Higdon enjoys more than 200 performances a year of her works. Her creations have been recorded on over 60 CDs. The Library of Congress recently announced the 2019 list of recordings selected as oral treasures worthy of preservation because of their cultural, historical, and aesthetic importance to the nation's recorded sound heritage. Jennifer Higdon's 2008 percussion concerto recording with Colin Curry as soloist and Marin Alsop conducting the London Philharmonic, was added to this prestigious list. That is what we'll listen to in a few minutes. But first, let's listen to her talk about how she got started in music. I had the pleasure of interviewing her in 2006, and I asked her that question. Well, I came to composing through flute playing. Uh, I started out on flute at the age of 15, which is a pretty late start. I taught myself to play from a band band method book, of all things, that was laying around the house. And I went off to college, not really knowing much classical music, but decided I was going to major in music. And I had a very good flute teacher, Judith Bentley, incredible teacher. She got me started on composing. I must have said something in a lesson that triggered triggered her saying, I want you to write a piece. Because I said, well, how do you write a piece? So, and should, how, so how old were you? <laughs> At that point, I think I was like... Um, Probably 19 or 20. Mm-hmm. So, it, But you didn't have like piano lessons as a child? No, I didn't. I did not have, we didn't have classical music in the household. That was my next question. Yeah, yeah, there was no classical music in the household. Mm-hmm. My dad's an artist. He worked at home. We had a lot of um, rock, bluegrass, folk. Mm-hmm. This was during the 60s. So it was everything from the Rolling Stones to Peter, Paul, and Mary. And did you love it all? Or? Yeah, I liked it yeah. all, actually. Um, but there was no classical. That's really the ironic thing. So I don't know what made me think I should go into classical music. You must have heard it somewhere. Well, you know, I was in band in high school, but that's a pretty far cry from classical music. (laughs) It really is. I mean, we would do movie music. I remember doing the music to Rocky in the marching band. But something resonated the, about it, though. The first, like the first piece of classical music that you fell in love with. Then? You know, I think it was Aaron Copland's Appalachian Spring. Mm-hmm. I heard it somewhere at a distance on a radio, and this is the ironic thing. I remember now that I heard the middle section. I didn't actually hear the beginning of it. I didn't hear the announcer say what it was, and I remember thinking, "Why? This sounds like the Smoky Mountains," because I lived at the base of the Smoky Mountains in East Tennessee, and I was really surprised when they mm-hmm. came on and said Aaron Copland. Appalachian Spring, I was like, oh, that's amazing. I, how could a composer capture that's that wonderful. sort of sound? So I think that's probably the first piece that I really got to know. So I did it backwards from, he was probably, yeah, he was living at that time. Mm-hmm. So uh, it was from the contemporary music to go backwards and learn. And then, but then you went to? I went to Bowling Green and this flute teacher had me write a piece and I, I it was a little bit like getting bit by a bug. I enjoyed it so much that I just kept writing. I kept playing, but I started kind of writing on the side, squeezing it in, and uh, I decided I wanted to do that. I knew immediately that that was the path that I wanted to take. So did you gra- Did your undergraduate degree, was that in composition? Then? Actually, my undergraduate degree was in flute performance. Mm-hmm. It was, but I did what I did was I applied to a couple of schools, and I got into Curtis, which I, now that I think back on it, I don't know how I got into Curtis, and I used the time there getting an artist diploma to switch over to composition, basically to make up deficits. Classes I needed, counterpoint, Mm -hmm. things that I really didn't have a background on, but I needed as a composer. And that gave me enough of a portfolio to apply to graduate schools. Then I went to the University of Pennsylvania, which was right up the street from Curtis in Mm -hmm. Philadelphia. Did you you start listening to massive amounts of, you know, Beethoven? (laughs) Yeah, you know, I had to listen to a lot of standard repertoire because the degree program at Penn required that. The infamous drop the needle, which now I don't know what they call it, CD excerpt (laughs) maybe. But it was drop the needle then, yeah. <laughs> trying to learn standard repertoire. And even to this day, I must confess that I don't even know all the standard repertoire. A lot of my fellow composers, like when I wrote a piano trio a couple of years ago, I didn't know any works. I had to ask pianist friends of mine, what should I listen to? I don't know any of the literature. Yeah. So they were making lists for me, and I was listening to all 
the fantastic piano trios are out there, actually. It was a nice kind of bit of discovery. Right. It's different to come at that, though, when you have no background in piano trios and you're learning it, but you've got the, the knowledge of what how music's put together, what's there, yeah. as opposed to when you're just listening a lot when you're young and you, yeah. you know, oh, I like this, and you don't know what makes up that piece. Do you think that the early music, though, in your in your early years, the, the rock and the whatever influences your writing, since those were such yes, uh, important I, years? I think to... it, it hugely influences yeah. my writing. I think I have a need for clear rhythm or pulse. I think that that's a very prominent thing because I listened to so much of the Beatles growing up. I listened mm -hmm. to an extraordinary amount of the Beatles. Um, and my parents were always taking me to experimental art festivals. We lived in Atlanta for a time. And there were tons of film festivals, really unusual films and um, art exhibitions. And my dad paints some, and he does films also. So it was interesting. We saw a lot of, during the 60s, we saw things. Both my brother and I would look at these things and say, this is art, I don't know. But it, it helped me actually formulate what my idea of art was early on. Mm -hmm. By the time I was seven or eight, I'd gotten the need to experiment out of my system because I'd been to so much experimental art that I realized, even at that age, I needed a little more form in my art. So every little bit influences you, but definitely, I think all the pop music, the bluegrass, the country, all of it, mm -hmm. it definitely infiltrates what I write now. Have you ever written a piece with art as the inspiration or written a piece about a painting as many composers have? You know, I think about painting, the act of painting when I'm writing a lot of times. Um, but in fact, when I was writing Blue Cathedral, my orchestral tone poem, I had this image in my head of a glass cathedral in the sky. And I think I have that kind of imagery a lot when I'm writing. Um, sometimes I think about the colors in the orchestra, but I think in terms of painting a palette, how am I going to combine the reds and the blues and the greens? Do I want to change the color? So I, I tend to think mm -hmm. I don't. It's I don't have the synesthesia, the yeah. the thing where you see colors when you hear certain sounds. But my relationship to art seems to be geared towards a visual aspect. Mm -hmm. Her orchestral work, Blue Cathedral, is one of the most performed contemporary orchestral works in the repertoire, more than 650 performances since its premiere in 2000. Now, let's listen to her percussion concerto.